party and ideology. So um, in this lecture, I will focus much more on the party, on the party-state relationship, uh, because the institutions uh, is quite complicated and complex. Uh, regarding ideology, I will you know just go forward with it because you know uh, I guess it's uh, it's not too controversial. I mean, in terms of marginal fault, uh, dumb shopping theory, you know, so I will spend more time uh, in the former past for the party and party state system. So um, for the first part here, um, the first thing is that you know I mean every time if you try to uh, talk to I mean someone who live in a Western countries or who live in a democratic country, we will have problem to explain the Chinese system to them. Because this is not actually a democratic system. And uh, even this is not a authoritarian system, I mean part of the decision making process would be something authoritarian. But if you refer to the structure, but this is something more than authoritarian I would say. So it's quite complicated. Um, the first thing you will have to, I mean, uh, perhaps think about is um, for the Chinese system, I mean, politically it's going to be very, I mean, bureaucratic. Of course, you would argue that, you know, in the West, uh, you, you would also have a very highly bureaucratic system, right? But for China, it's not the case because you have some sort of legwork. And the legwork actually is about the personal relationship. Um, so that's why it makes everything much more complicated. Sometimes if you have a powerful person he or she can override the institutions itself. So this is the problem. So that's why I would say highly bureaucratic science according to personal relationship. Um, and the power of the post actually uh, is important, but it depends on which post that you're talking about. I mean whether the post itself is in a higher hierarchy or whether the post itself is the government, or whether this is in the party, of course in the party then uh, the post is much more influential than the post in the government. Uh, centralized system, because everything you have to get it done uh, with the top leadership discussions, uh, and I wouldn't say this is something institutionalized, because if you refer to institutionalized, it means that every step, every policy, every procedure, uh, we know the rules, we, we also know the regulations, right? But for China, even if you have the institutions here, but you can have other ways to, I mean, work you on, or even you can detect the institutions. So I wouldn't say this is institutionalized, a uh, very mature system here, but you know, they have another kind of personal network system to work it out. So that's why top leaders, they have a lot of power, very powerful. Um, so the, the personal relationship here, uh, we have a term in China's politics. When you tell someone uh, guanxi, guanxi this is exactly I mean the word in, in China. Guanxi it means personal relationship. So um, I mean the the guanxi actually is not something uh, happened only in the CCP or after the establishment of the People's Republic of China in 1949. It's something inherent in the Chinese culture. Guanxi I would say uh, in the Chinese culture if you have a very good personal relationship with someone and then all the time you can get it through the proper or the I mean um, established institutions so that's why Guanxi is very important to the, to the Chinese people so let's say if you have a friend or if you even have a relative in the government or maybe in the past you have a friend you have a you have a relative in court then you are going to be very I mean uh, going to be beneficial from that kind of personal relationship with that person in the government or in the court. So, um, something, let's go back to uh, the PLC voice now. Something you have to think about is that the personal relationship here, the network, uh, we are talking about something like factions, okay? Uh, the factions here, so let's say, which born or which factions you belong to. Uh, if you refer to the Jiang Jiangmen's era, they will say that you know this is the faction from Shanghai because Jiang Zemin he he came from Shanghai, and then when he went to Pager he bought along with the colleagues in Shanghai, so this is the Shanghai factions because of that personal relationship, uh, those people have established with Jiang Zemin when they work in Shanghai, or if you refer to Hu Jintao's uh, era, then this is something like you know whether you're the person 
in the communist uh, Yao village. Because Hu Jintao in the past, he worked in the communist uh, Yao village. So if you was uh, Hu Jintao's, let's say, uh, colleagues before, then probably when Hu Jintao rise up, then you would have a proposal government, or even in the party. Uh, Xi Jinping actually, uh, I guess you may know, uh, Xi Jinping's father is actually one of the Chinese leaders, but it's not the top one. So that's why we would say this is the, you know, uh, Prince things, okay? Because, you know, um, he's the heir or he's the, you know, uh, sons of, you know, one or two, you know, uh, former Chinese leaders. So that's why this is the problem here. When you have the rise of a new leader, the new leader's background actually determines, you know, who he or she's going to appoint in the coming future in the party and in the government. Um, so what about something I missed here? What about Mao Dong or Zhao Nai? What's the network? Any guess here? What was the network of Mao Zedong and Zhao Enlai, <coughs> the previous leader? The network. Which? Village, 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 right? Peasants, rural, more than that. Apart from peasants, village, more than that. Zhao Enlai is what? Sorry? Foreign policy, yes, uh, but it's not about foreign policy people. It's about a common experience. It, it's not really about village. It's a common experience that you know you determine whether this person is powerful enough to stay the party. And this is something that we have talked about in the previous lecture. What's your guess? What were the important events? The place that he came from, the blue thing that you showed in the map. The blue and the red thing. After that. After that. After the Genesis Soviet, the, not, not, not education, not education. The, uh, the long march. The long march. Yeah. After the Genesis Soviet, when the Trans Communist Party can't just retreat, I will show you a very interesting game later. I mean, uh, but think about this those Chinese leaders that suffered and then they survived after the long march. If you're lucky enough, if you do not die actually, then you are the people who experienced in long march for a year, right? You are the revolutionary people. So that's why if you refer to the lack of, you know, Mao Zedong, Zhao Enlai, you know, Deng Xiaoping, those people, they're tough guys because they suffered, they really fought a war in the past. So this is the lack work. So that's why when I refer to uh, Zhang Zemin, Hu, Hu Jintao, I would say those people that the technocrats. The technocrats here means that they have no experience in a real war in the long march. So they're not revolutionaries. So they're not that powerful when you compare with Deng Xiaoping or with Mao Zedong. So these are the factions that you can emerge But I mean, one thing is uh, quite interesting. Some scholars argue that you know it's quite hard for you to prove that relationship, right? Um, or even Xi Jinping now, if you refer to the 19th Party, you know, Congress. Uh, how can we know this is actually, I mean, the, the personal arrangement is affected by, you know, uh, the, the principles. It's very hard to identify. So someone actually criticized this kind of, you know, factional studies of Chinese politics. So I just want to present you both arguments here. Uh, we have some, maybe perhaps, possible explanations, but someone would say there's no co-relationship. Um, another thing is that, you know, uh, if you refer to one key person, let's say Mao Zedong or Deng Xiaoping, uh, because of their personal reputation, they, they themselves are more powerful than anybody or any institutions in China. I'll give you an example here. Deng Xiaoping, he had never been the general secretary of the CCP. He had never been the president of the PRC. He only, he only holds two chairmanships. One is the chairman of the Central Military Commission, <coughs> which owns the military. Then it's powerful, right? Another one is the Card Game Association. This is the Chinese Bridge Game Associations. The Card Game Associations. But that position is actually, you know, <laughs> just kidding, but I mean, it's the positions of the Central Military Commission only, only in the army, and then it makes him more powerful than any other persons in the, I mean, party bureau, in, in, in the party, or in the government, because he owns the military because of his personal reputations and also experience. So this is quite interesting, right? So that's why we refer to this. It's not about institutions. 
This is more like about personal relationship, personal experience, reputations within the party, uh, whether you can convince the others you are the you are the you know a white person to do the party. So um, another thing about Chinese uh, communist parties that you know you have the state society relationship, which is quite different from the democratic society. I mean, in a democratic society, you have a nine. But the line sometimes actually is, is blurred, right? But I mean, you still can differentiate between public and private. I mean, um, I mean, if you draw a line, so let's say, uh, if you draw a line from left hand side to right hand side, so let's say left hand side is uh, private, right hand side is public. If I say the government has more intervention to the private side on left hand side. Then this is something like authoritarian country, or if the government has complete control on the private sector, then this is totalitarian country, right? And in reverse, if the line actually draw from the left hand side to right hand side, if you have a balance, then this could be democracy, right? Because you have public and private, you know, you have the balance here. But what happens if you have the left hand side dominant on the right hand side? Then this is what we call anarchy, right? The people, the private sector. Uh, dominate, you know, um, on the public area. So this is anarchy. But for China, this is not the case. Because you have the party, I would say they penetrate very heavily, deep down in the Chinese society. So let's say, I mean, in village level, at the village level here, I mean, the party committee is actually, you know, most of them, I would say, handle around 1,000 people. So it means that you have one party cadre. And that's part of country he or she will handle at least around 1,000 people locally. But I would say this is the statistics, you know, in the past, I'm not quite sure, but this is the statistics that are roughly in the 1990s, late 1990s, so I'm not quite sure if, because I couldn't get the data now. So um, perhaps even more more penetrations here. But if you compare with the Qing Dynasty, I mean, one, uh, let's say, local government, I mean, they would try to handle 200,000 people, so, the Trust Communist Party actually penetrate very deeply, even when compared to the Chang Dynasty. Uh, and that's why they have a lot of those committees. Neighborhood committees, township committees, small village committees here, but actually the committees handle the daily affairs of those other people in China. So this is very structuralized, organized, penetrate very in depth uh, down into China's society. And, um, the third thing that you know we can talk about the parties is that you know this is horizontal uh, control, but also vertical control. But horizontal, I will come back for vertical control later. But horizontal control here means that you have the parallel system, because this is a party state. The parallel system it means that you know at each level, mm -hmm. let's say the township level, uh, the province, the provincial level. Municipal level, anything the central government level, you have parallel positions. Let me skip a bit here. Well, this is the this is the chart that I talked to Cynthia for a lot of time. That you know, I, I'm going to show you. It's very important. I mean, uh, this is what we call the horizontal. I mean, level. I mean, in I mean, um, in different sectors at each level here, you will have the parallel positions here. For example, you have the village committee. Uh, the village committee is the executive branch. At the same time, at the same level, you have the village party committee. So this is something in the party branch. The same case for township, for county, municipal governments, and also provincial government, and also the central government. Let's say if you want to be a member of the state council, if you want to be the vice premier or the, even the prime minister. Well, actually, you have to be a member at least at the level of the party bureau, or even perhaps maybe the standing committee member of the party bureau. If you're not the persons in these two committees here, then you never, you, you never will be the people, the top executive government. The same case here. At each level, you have the horizontal parallel positions here. Can I ask you a question here? Which person is more powerful? I mean, the person in the executive or the person in the party? Which one is more powerful? But they have the same positions. But all the time, the party, uh, I mean, uh, cadres, they're more powerful 
and the officials in the government. So this is what we call the party state. The party control the state. <laughs> okay. We'll come back to this, you know, uh, later. Um, so this is about horizontal control here. Uh, public committee don't make the local decisions. Sometimes the independent even in government board. It's not the government officials here. Um, another thing is that you know who's the boss. I mean, who's the who's the top leader? Okay. Um, the second question here. The general secretary of the CCP, president of China, or the chairman of the Chinese uh, Central Military Commission. Who's the boss? Military. An objection here? No? Okay. All of you think that military, uh, I mean, positions is the most important, right? But uh, well, this is quite interesting. I mean, if you refer to history, actually the, the, the boss issue here, this is about succession issue. Who's going to be the next one? So, um, I would say in China, we have a problem here. <laughs> We, we never know who's going to be the next one. I mean, the same case for democratic countries. You're, you're not going to understand who's going to be the next in, in the Indian Prime Minister, right? After elections, then you will know. But the problem is that we didn't have election in China. <laughs> uh, I mean, before the election, you will you know, have some sort of statistics, and you have survey, and then you have a general understanding that you know which party is going to be the dominating party, right? And, and who is going to be the Prime Minister, right? The same for the case of the UK, the same for the case of the US, right? Because you have survey, you have poll, except Donald Trump. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but anyway, for China, the problem is that we have election, but election is very local. I mean, within the party, so let's say, you will have the uh, party election at the local level, so let's say uh, the township, village party committee, then you have elections. So after these two, you know, the lower level of elections, they will try to have some sort of more complicated ele electoral method. Uh, they will try those committee members. They will try to choose the, you know, uh, persons on the top level. So it's too complicated. I don't have time to go through all the things uh, in today's lecture. But you know, uh, on the top one, they still vote. But when you go up, let's say let's say people would vote, but still they would say this is the election here. It's democratic according to the Chinese understanding. Sorry, technically, I could get the Chinese party's understanding, mm -hmm. not the general people. Uh, but now, if you don't have the election here, how do we know who's going to be the next leader in China? Right? Um, so the first crisis actually um, happened in Mao Zedong year. So I, I don't know if you have heard about a person who, whose name is uh, Nen Biao. Okay. So Nen Biao actually, uh, Mr. Nen, he, he's a uh, Staunch supporter of Mao Zedong. Uh, Nambel, he, he was a general, military general, to help Mao Zedong to fight against various wars, including the civil war against the Nationalist Party. But during the Cultural Revolution, he, he planned a coup d'etat to assassinate Mao Zedong, and then it's not successful. And then he traveled by plane to escape China, to escape from China, and then he wanted to go to somewhere in Soviet Union. But the plane was crushed over the territory of Mongolia, and he was killed. At that time, actually, those people, they argued, perhaps Nan Biao, he would be the successor of Mao Zedong, but you know, he wouldn't wait. If he waited for maybe four or five years later, then he would be, perhaps, the leader of China, but you know, uh, he's not successful. So uh, at that time, many people, you know, questioned, who's going to be the next one to replace Mao Zedong? It's going to be Zhao Enlai, but actually Zhao Enlai died earlier than Mao Zedong. So we have this kind of you know, problem here. And Deng Xiaoping was not the successor. That's what we have talked about in the previous lecture. You have the power struggle between Hua Gofeng and Deng Xiaoping. So Hua Gofeng actually, uh, he got three positions. Uh, oh, sorry, he got two positions. Uh, the, the general secretary of the CCP and also the president of China. But Hua Gofeng, he never made it to the chairman of the Central Military Commission. So that's why Deng Xiaoping would push him down and then, get, and then Deng Xiaoping got back to power. So there are a lot of those calculations, power struggle, no one could tell who's going to survive, you know, in the last place. So this is, I don't know, is this something interesting? <laughs> I mean, is this something that you, 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 you would expect to I mean, study, but no one can actually tell very clearly. Uh, the same case for Deng Xiaoping. 
when Deng Xiaoping considered the power, then you know he appointed two persons, Hu Yaobang and Zhao Jie. But Hu Yaobang was purged during the I mean anti bourgeois liberalization campaign, and Zhao Jiang was kept was kept out as arrest after June fourth. Originally, these two would be the ideal successor, but you know it comes out another case. So Zhang Jiang just you know uh, pop up suddenly. He, uh, I mean, appears to be the most ideal person at the correct time and the correct place. And he did one thing to, I mean, um, close and crush that, I mean, newspaper that, you know, he attracted attention from the and that's it. So no one would tell who's going to be the successor. The first peaceful succession happens in, you know, uh, from Zhang Zemin to Hu Jintai. This is peaceful. And uh, Hu Jintai actually, he was the heir, he was appointed by Deng Xiaoping. Hu Jintao was already in the standing committee of the Port Bureau for more than like 10 years, a decade. And um, at that time, Zhang Jimin passed two positions to Hu Jintao. One is the general secretary of the CCP, and the other is the press of PRC, press of China to, to uh, Hu Jintao. But Zhang Jimin, he kept the post of the central military commissions for a year. So the gesture is very clear. On the left hand side, uh, anyone know Chinese here? Except those colleagues from Hong Kong or from China. Anyone knows Chinese here? So, um, do you want to try something here? <laughs> okay. <laughs> what, what can you find in the people's state? Well, this is people's state. <clears throat> and this is the time that, you know, Hu Jintao, he has already, you know, got the two poses I mentioned. But from from the front page of People's Daily, uh, is there anything that uh, you, you, you can spot here? So the first one, Zhang Zemin um, talked to the German Chancellor over phone. The second one, Zhang Zemin uh, also talked to the uh, American President over phone. And this one, the biggest one, uh, Zhang Zemin proposed the three represents theory. And then Zhang Zemin um, were trying to encourage um, military reform in China with Chinese characteristics. Um, this is not something about Zhang Zemin leader Hu Jintao, but I mean Hu Jintao, you have this one. Sorry, but uh, well, this is even not about Hu Jintao. This is about you know uh, the meeting uh, of the party, and then you have Zhang Zemin, Hu Jintao, Li Nanqing, okay, Hu 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 Bang, and Hu Jintao the name. Hu Jintao the name here. It's just under Zhang Jimin. But remember, at that time, Hu Jintao, uh, he was already the head of two positions, President of China and the General Secretary of the CCP. But obviously, from the newspaper here, you would understand who is more powerful. It must be Zhang Jimin, because he's still the chairman of the Central Military Commission here. So, um, the purpose is that you know if you can keep that position, actually you can still manipulate Hu Jintao, and you can even manipulate the personal arrangement in part in the government for some years, not until you pass the positions of the chairman of the Central Military Commission to Hu Jintao, right? So this is you know a game here. So when Hu Jintao you know uh, consolidated the power, well one thing is very important. All the time, uh, we have a. Uh, uh, well, this is not formal. This is the informal observation. How could you understand that Chinese leader has already consolidated the power? We have a gesture. We have a ceremony for that. We have an activity. Anyone guess it? What's that activity ceremony? And you know, and then you can you, you can understand the person. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, the Chinese leader he has already consolidated the power. Which activity or ceremony? One, uh, but this is this is an event and also a ceremony. But this is not something formal, I would say. But everyone, we will try to observe uh, from this event if that Chinese leader could attend that event. That means that you know he has already consolidated the power. Event, ceremony, activity, very important event actually. It's something about um, if I if I if I tell you the new you will know. <laughs> <laughs>
invitation to the Congress? It's not about the Congress. It's outdoor activity. <laughs> it's an outdoor activity. It's not game. What, what kind of game? It's not about game. U.S. celebration. U.S. what? U.S. celebration. No, no, no. Outdoor activity, <laughs> outdoor sports. ceremony. It's not sports. It's not sports. Music. 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 No, no, no. Well, I, I'm going to tell you. Please. Is it to do with food? Sorry. No, no, no. Funeral of the dead president. Any, any more try here? Funeral of the dead president. What's your answer? No, no, no birthday. No. This is about uh, well, one more hint, and then you should know. This is about military. Mm. The military parade. Thank you. Parade. 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 You got it correctly, right? Before, before I, I, I tell you. National National Thank you, exactly. And what did the Chinese leader do? I mean, Hu Jintao, Zhang Zemin, Deng Xiaoping, what did they do actually? If you have watched the Chinese military parade, what did they do? <laughs> well, the, the whole procedure is very structured and organized. Uh, you will have the top Chinese leader. Even he is not the person uh, as a general secretary of the party, he's not the person of the president of China. But if he is the president of the of the chairman of the Central Media Commission, then you know, he will uh, I mean um, get on a car and the car is actually uh, worthless and then you can show you know half half of the body on the top of the car and then the car will move slowly, slowly from where? From Tiananmen Square, which is traditionally the center of Chinese politics, starting from Ming Dynasty, Qing Dynasty, nowadays. The part of the office nowadays is in next to you know Tiananmen Square, you know in Zhongnan. And the leader will, you know, the car actually will, you know, uh, took the leader, you know, drive from Tiananmen Square along the Chang'an Avenue in Beijing, which is the major street in Beijing. And then on on the two sides, you will have different military forces. Land troops, you know, naval forces, you know, air forces here, and including artillery forces who control nuclear weapons and also missile defense. And um, what the Chinese leader did is that you know, um, he he said something, right? Do you know who? What, what did he say? Comrades, you are hard working. Yeah, something like that, right? Uh, Comrades, you are hard working, and then uh, the reply from the soldiers is that you know, the reply is very interesting. The soldiers reply will be saying something. Uh, service for the people. <laughs> yeah, but this is not the key. Service for the people is true, but yeah. the key is about you know, um, hello chairman. Hello, but, but think about this, hello chairman. Mm. Chairman. Yes. It's not general secretary. Mm. It's not general secretary. It's not. I mean, hello general secretary. It's not hello president. President of China. Hello chairman means hello chairman of the Central Military Commission. So this is this is the key. If you want to examine whether let's say whether whether Hu Jintao is already you know um, on the top of the party, if Hu Jintao would do that, then obviously he's the he's he's the head of the party. If Hu Jintao couldn't do it, then sorry, it's still Jiang Jin. And another you know. Opportunity for us to observe is about Xi Jinping. The same case that you know, what time or you know where was Xi Jinping organized that military parade? It actually reflects whether Xi Jinping he can control the party and also the military. But actually, Xi Jinping you know he did faster than Hu Jintao because when Hu Jintao passed the post to Xi Jinping, Hu Jintao passed all the posts to Xi Jinping at the same time. Chairman of the Central Military Commission. General Secretary of the CCP and also President of China. So Xi Jinping organized the military period very soon, very quickly. It's not the same with Hu Jintao. And uh, the time when I uh, just departed to India actually last week, it should be. Xi Jinping organized another giant military parade uh, in, in, in the Hawaii, okay, And other military you know, uh, base in different provinces, they, 
they also organize that parade, you know, and then they have the, you know, uh, cyber cam, you know, to observe or to listen to the statement from Xi Jinping. So this is very, I mean, significant because at, at, in the past, not many Chinese leaders would try to organize the military parade so frequently. But Xi Jinping, you know, he's a he, he, he's the first one I would say. And the previous one, he organized the campaign uh, in a very uh, hot summer in in the Mongolia. If you refer to that radio parade, actually some soldiers they just couldn't hang on, and then you know one or two soldiers just try to you know uh, you know fit, uh, fall, fall, fall down or something like that, right? So this is you know uh, how could they assess the Chinese leadership? I mean uh, whether he has concerned the power here. But the problem is that you know um, we know Hu Jintao is going to be the next leader because he was appointed by Deng Xiaoping. Hu Jintao was already there for ten years, and all of us. We expect he's going to be the next one after Zhang Zemin. And Xi Jinping was also appointed by Hu Jintao 10 years before. And we also understand, expect, you know, Xi Jinping will be the next one. Xi Jinping just passed the five year tenure, but we couldn't find it here. He had, Xi Jinping has never appointed anybody in the standing committee of the Politburo. Yes. Uh, yes, one of the vice president. One of one of them. We have vice president, but you know we couldn't find out the head. No, he is the chairperson of all the committees. If you ask me, sitting king. Yeah, yes. He's not going to find an ad for next five years because he wants to have a third term. That's absolutely correct. Correct, accurate. Okay, many people right now they wonder. Um, whether Xi Jinping is going to break the news, or but this is not the news actually, this is the norms. The norms is that they were going to have 10 years, right, uh, in their region. Let's say for Jiang Zemin, for Hu Jintao, five years in the first term, another five years for the second term, right? But someone would say that Xi Jinping perhaps just like Putin in Russia. Yeah. You, you, can try, you can try to do it you know, as a president for maybe perhaps another five or another 10 years. But this is the problem, I would say. Um, whether the Chinese people they accept this kind of, let's say, prolonging news here, whether they really love Xi Jinping, this is the problem. So that's why if you refer to Xi Jinping's policy, no matter this is one by one rule, no matter this is about the domestic politics here, or even uh, maybe some sort of challenge, Xi Jinping you know, appealed himself very closely to the Chinese people because they, he, he wants to read the legitimacies and recognitions from the people. But then someone will say that it's dangerous. When you appeal too much to the people, but the people they're not necessarily rational. If those people ask you to have a war against India, <laughs> which we just mentioned during the tea break, or if the people ask you to fight a war against Japan, then how can you turn down this kind of less holistic tide? It's very dangerous, it's very populist. So I would say, you know, this is a problem we have no here. Uh, and another thing. <laughs> you, you have a powerful leader who want to consolidate, right? Yeah, yeah. And then you also have a problem where you don't have a you you have a position where there is a power vacuum because after yeah. me who after the leader who yeah, right? yeah. But the leader is in a difficult situation because if you groom somebody, that leader could threaten uh, him. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so if you leave it open. It is detrimental for the country because if there is a power vacuum, then there is a power struggle and all those things. But yeah. the leader is helpless. Yeah, yeah, right. I agree. Yeah, yeah. that's true. Yes. So is there any uh, party constitution <laughs> to take up in this we have policy decision? But we, we, we have, just like in the United States, if you have any problem regarding the president, then you will have the vice president or the premier to take up the affairs, right? It couldn't help in China. He's not a man to, I mean, no, uh, sorry, I just want to say Kenneth, but anyway. I mean, um, if you refer to the United States, if Donald Trump died, right, <laughs> suddenly, and then the last, you know, uh, president would be automatically the president of the United States, and he would also automatically to be the um, military chief of staff yes, yeah. for the military. This is written in American Constitution. Yes. And then even if the vice president, you know, died, if you refer to Hollywood movie, it happens all the time, and then it will be the defense secretary, yes. right? But for China, 
the military is not in the hands of the civilian government. So this is the problem. I mean, you know, this is not about the positions of president or vice president. This is about the positions of the military commissions, uh, the, the central military commissions. You know, um, here. So no one would tell, or no one would try to understand or figure out what, what will happen because no one would want this to happen. But this is something interesting for studying Chinese politics because no one can expect what will come out in the next step. But anyway, uh, this is for sure a problem here. Okay, so that's that's why I go back to uh, what I have talked about. This is not something institutionalized. If you refer to constitutions, it doesn't help because this is the party state. Okay, so um, let's move on here. Uh, we just um, so um, table here, right? Uh, the chart here, right? So this is uh, party control executive. So I highlight two organs here: the Central Committee, the Standing Committee, the Court Bureau here. They are the most powerful organs within the party. So the Central Committee here, which is just after the National, P uh, the National Party's Congress, okay, the Central Committee. But this is uh, what we call the power organ, because all the things that you have to discuss and you have to change, it must go through the Central Committee, and then they can turn on the whole policy, the shift of policy uh, from one side to the other side. So this is the most powerful organ. But I mean, all the time you cannot caught those members for meeting very frequently and very often. So that's why we refer to the standing committee of the point of view, which is this one. And then you try to select some, I mean, top tenants and, I mean, most influential Chinese countries to be the standing committee member of the point of view. But, I mean, for the point of view here, there must be the, I mean, member here in the committee part, in the central committee, and there should be what's now uh, among 40 to 50 something, and then you have the waiting list on the party bureau. But once you get to the party bureau, it means that you're going to be a rising star very soon. You have a chance to be an influential leader in the coming future. But if you couldn't make it, then sorry, you are you are you are doomed. Have you heard about Bo Xi Lai? Bo Xi Lai, um, he's the um, he's the former governor of a municipality in Chongqing. Uh, I guess that you may have heard about Bo Xila because you know uh, he was finally arrested by the central government by accusing uh, him corruption and but I mean all, all of us know this is about Coup uh, It seems that Bo Xila, he contacted the military officers uh, in the PLA, People's Liberation Army. Uh, it seems that he wants to, I mean, get some support from the military, uh, from the Central Military Commission, so that you can over overthrow the top Chinese state. And that's why he was caught, he was arrested in the charges of corruption, you know. Uh, but actually, the real reason is about, you know, group D8 here. Um, but why he actually did this? Because, you know, uh, he couldn't get into the party people. I mean, he started his career in, you know, uh, Danian. Dalian is the northeastern part of China, it's a part of the city. Many people love him. And then um, he got promoted to be the governor, to be the general secretary, not governor, general secretary of the you know, uh, Chongqing municipality. And then he organized different campaigns. And he thought that he could be, I mean, uh, summoned into the party bureau in next party congress. But it turns out uh, what he... <laughs> What he did in Dalian and Chongqing couldn't bring him to the party bureau. He's not quite happy about it, about this, and that's why he organized. He tried to organize Group D, and then Xi Jinping just cracked him down. So this is the problem. If you couldn't get into the party bureau, let's say in fifth, in fifties something, then you do because think about this. Your career goes very often starting from township and then to municipality and then to province. And then in province, you still have to think about whether you are the people in the executive branch or you're the people in the party branch. If you're in the party branch, then you have more advantage than those people in the executive branch. But let's say if you can get into the central government uh, or into the you know uh, party bureau in fifties, in your fifties, you still have ten years to show up your capability or to gain your influence to be the next Chinese leader. When you get into that post, then you are almost 60s. So that's why I would always say that, you know, if you want to be a, to be a Chinese leader, you have to be, you know, a very, you know, a good health person. 
<laughs> don't die in your 50s or you know uh, 55, 56, and then if you die at that time, well, not kidding. Uh, one of the uh, Chinese vice president Wang Wang Gok, okay, Wang Xu, uh, his the Shanghai factions. He was summoned by Jiang Zemin to to Beijing, and then he actually died uh, because of cancer in his uh, 56 or 57 something. If he could survive, probably, I mean, Xi Jinping may not be, you know, uh, his competitor. So, I mean, good health, which everyone here is very important, not for Chinese, but also for everyone. But, I mean, <laughs> particularly for Chinese leaders, you will have a good health here. I mean, if you couldn't get into the Port Bureau in your 50s, then almost your career is finished. You never get it, okay? So, if you can get into the Port Bureau in the 50s, and then another step is that, you know, whether you have a chance to be a standing committee in the in the party view. If you have, then the next step would be very likely uh, you would be one of the top leaders both within the party and also within the government. You could be the vice premier, you could be the state councillor, and you could be the vice president. But the prerequisite is that you have to be an influential and a very, I mean, um, outstanding uh, charges in the highest hierarchy in the party. Uh, so a standing committee actually, you can see this is very powerful. Why it's now seven members, but I, I mean in the past <coughs> year, nine members. But in the past, as well as five members. So it can be changed. No one would say, well, this is not something written down in the party's you know, regulations. It's not something, it's not about the state. <coughs> so no one would say whether you should have three, five, seven, nine or something, but they would say this is collective mechanisms. And the number must be single. Because the, the, the party guards would, would, would say that you know we better to have a voting. So the single number is very important, five, seven, and nine. So they make it collectively, I mean, um, on the top decision making process. They would try to vote. But no one would tell the voting procedure. No one, no one knows, okay? They want to keep it, well, you, you couldn't get it. I mean, the result is not published on the website. <laughs> Sorry about that. But you know, we know they have some sort of collective decisions mechanisms here. First, we'll, I mean, go through consensus. If you have the majority, then no vote. But if you have a rather divergent approach here, then you will vote whether you have, you know, four versus B or maybe, you know, uh, other choices here. But basically, the standing committee of the party bureau it deals with everything, from party affairs, from the organizations, who are able to appoint in the government, uh, public and education. Well, public and education is very important because. We're talking about indoctrination. You try to, I mean, block some sort of information, and then you try to enhance those people's belonging to the Chinese Communist Party. You love the party, you also love the country. Right? We have the debate here. If you love the country, but if you do not love the party, is it okay? Sorry, no. You have to love the both country and the party. But for Hong Kong people, I, we would say we love the country, but we not we do not love the party. <laughs> so we're not politically correct here, right? Um, but this is about how do we indoctrinate the people <coughs> propaganda about education here. Um, but seriously, I can tell you a case because I'm teaching in uh, the university for for my third year, and then we have a master course. The master course the name is Greater uh, China uh, Studies. Um, we we could some students from mainland China, and all the time those students would ask the questions about you know why would you say China is a threat or China is not democratic. I just couldn't, you know, emerge these questions from the from the floor, and then I would try to explain from the Western perspective, and then they would say, "Well, this is not true. You are applying the Western theories to explain the case of China." So you can imagine how I mean that kind of indoctrination actually, you know, work out in China because they have been indoctrinated for many years. They do not think that the system has any problem. And this is all about you know the standing committee. How will they control the education? How will they control the propaganda here, uh, including other affairs, political, legal affairs here, finance, economics. No matter you name it, okay? Because I guess that you know I don't have much time here, right? So I have to be quick. Uh, and finally, the military side, the CCP actually were trying to claim that the army, apart from its own by the party, is also you know have some sort of civilian role here. But they try to you know give a role to, to, to the to the to the military. But obviously this is on their gesture. Okay. They try to make it, you know, just like the United States, Japan, 
but it's really about the party. Um, another, uh, we, we have two groups here. Uh, we have some I mean, other organs here. So let's say the leading small group and also other departments here is not listed in the, in, in the, in the chart. So the leading small group is, is that um, because you have the horizontal and very structuralized vertical I mean, um, system, but then you will have problem. For example, if you were the um, governor on the side of the you know, executive branch, you will be checked by the party parties. At the same time, if you have any coordinations or let's say cooperation, it's not possible because you have to listen to the order from the top. But not, you know, at the same level, let's say I'm from the uh, Department of Transport. I have cooperation with the Department of, let's say, uh, uh, water spy, whatever, okay. You, you're going to have much collaboration here because of this is the, at the same level and um, you will have to wait for the order from the top. So at that time then you will have to make sure that you have the small leading group. The small leading group is composed of the you know um, senior cadres. So um, let's say you will have the people, let's say premier, vice premier, or maybe you know, uh, even advisors of the you know, world policy, basically you have a group of people and then they were trying to uh, give or draft a policy to coordinate different branches and different departments within um, the government. Give you one example here. Um, the one bell one road, which India is not quite I mean happy with that, that one, right? Um, Moody, the Indian Prime Minister would say this is the what's the term? This is the imperialistic or this is the colonial enterprise or something like that, right? Um, but think about this, one by one role, it involves a lot of those departments, right? Uh, you will have the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, you will have the Ministry of Commerce here. You will have the national commissions for reform here, and you have other stakeholders. So if you just issue a policy and then ask those ministry to do it, it's not going to be, I mean, very effective because you know each other will check against each other, and I'm not going to listen to you because we're at the same level. So in this case, you will have to find a very powerful person on the top to sit in a small leading group, and then the small leading group will try to submit all those relevant stakeholders and also those relevant ministries. And then that powerful person will try to coordinate all the efforts to mobilize those people to work. So this is one of the characteristics of the Chinese political system. So I can guarantee you that if you can tell someone about the small leading group, then you are the expert in the Chinese politics. This is not something you can find in the US or in the UK. So this is very important here. Um, so uh, a little bit to you, I mean, you know, you can try to, I mean, if you refer to the news, sometimes about one by one, by one row, about Hong Kong, even Hong Kong town, Macau affairs, you will have the leading small group here. They coordinate the effort. Um, other departments here, they're important, but they're not shown in the uh, chart here. Uh, for example, organization departments here, um, this is about personal arrangement logistics here. It's about the positions of the party as well as the government. Um, if you where the head of this department, then you're you're going to be very powerful because you can arrange those personal arrangements. You know, uh, who's going to be the minister of foreign affairs? Who's going to be you know uh, the vice premier? Of course, they have to listen to the order you know from the top. You can shape the policy. Um, public data department. It's important because you know all the time you can shape the society. Right. So um, whether you have uh, loosened regulations of internet or whether you have a tighter control and censorship, right? Uh, Bullock working department is important because, you know, the CCP actually rises up because of the peasants. So this is still traditional strong unit here. Uh, people stay together with war times, those what we call the state propaganda, you know, uh, mass media, and together with CCTV. Uh, it's not getting more important because of the concept of public diplomacy. China want to compete with the Western world in terms of any soft power. So if you can sell China to the other countries, so food, China daily, people's daily, CCTV, you know, then you know you can shape the public opinion, you can shape the opinion of the foreign public. In my another research, I will tell you this is not successful. Mm -hmm. uh, I would, oh, we don't have time here, but I mean, if we have other chances, I would I would tell you why. Okay, not in that research, but I mean. 
it's getting more important nowadays. So let's get back to the chart here. Uh, we now look at the executive branch here. We just, you know, went for the party. We now go to the executive, and this is the state council, okay? The state council. So uh, in the state council here, you can you can find it actually um, the boss of the state council is the you know prime minister or premier if you like. So uh, he's the head of the state council. Within the state council, um, you have uh, other boss premier and also state councilors. The boss premiers they have different roles. For example, one boss premier will be responsible for maybe foreign affairs, and then the other one will be responsible for maybe you know internal economic issues, um, soft debt. And then you have the state council is also responsible for different things. So uh, this is powerful. But remember, they are powerful because they are already the members from the standing committee of the party bureau, or at least a member in the party bureau. So that's why they are powerful. Not because of the institutions in the executive branch, because of the positions in the party. So the state council here, um, we would say the premier actually very often uh, his he, he, he ranks third uh, in the top of the leadership. So third, it means that after president and the vice president, then premier will be third. And then uh, you have other vice premiers here. Um, but actually, if you refer to the party's penetration to the government, well, this is the case here. You have the parallel horizontal arrangement here. Uh, even the province or in the township, we, we, we just went through for those you know, uh, issues here. But the State Council overlooked all those issues here, okay, to make sure that you know, the executive branch would work out according to the party's wishes and policies. Okay. So uh, this is about the State Council. So um, another one is about um, the judiciary, uh, or maybe you know, um, legislature. Well, I will put let's note party congress here in both judiciary and also uh, legislature. Do you know why? Well, we will call this as the rubber step, but I mean, the next the rubber step. The national people's congress actually, well, uh, if you want to pass the law, then you will have to submit, I mean, the bill to the national people's congress, and then it becomes the law, right? But at the same time, in China, it's not the court to make, I mean, the appeal of the legal cases. It's the, the final the final judgment actually is by National People's Congress. Give you an example. Um, in Hong Kong, we have the mini constitutions, and we call this as the basic law. In the <coughs> article of basic law, it, it was passed by the NPC, the National People's Congress. But when you have this bill, we do not have any courts can deal with that kind of you know legal issues, legal documents, and then we always come back to the National People's Congress for the final judgment, and then they will try to interpret the law or interpret the article. I mean, if you refer to the case of the Western countries, or if you refer to the case of the democratic countries, usually the legislature they will pass the law but they will not interpret the law. You will have the court to interpret the law. In the US, it's very clear. You will have the, um, what they call the final court, okay, the Supreme Court, to take over the legal cases and to interpret the law uh, which was passed by the Congress. So you have the checks and balances. Uh, the same case for UK or most of those uh, democratic countries, but for China, I'm sorry about that, but you will have the same institutions to make the law and then to interpret the law. Um, so that's why it can be something both in legislature and also in judiciary here. Um, so this is the uh, People's Great Hall in Beijing. If you if you have a chance to, to go to Beijing and then you know just um, in the areas around Tiananmen Square, uh, on, on, on one side is the uh, Mao Zedong's monument. Uh, you can st you can still see you know the board of Mao and then all the time you can pay tribute to him, but I mean not not for us, right? Um, um, but for Chinese people, they will visit that monument. But on the other hand, on on, on the other you know side, you have them. Um, this is the People's Great Hall, and what's that? We have two thousand two hundred something in terms of the membership, um, and um, the table here, all of those um, should be the top leaders. 
uh, the, the, the president, the vice premier, and also the point bureau here, and then you have other, you know, representatives from different province, from different provinces, and from different units, okay, and also from military. And this is mass media on the top, so this is the, you know, uh, place for them to, I mean, uh, hold the meeting here. But all the time we will say this is the proper step, okay. Um, but one thing is very, is very interesting. If you if you refer to the voting, all the time you will get over ninety percent of the vote agree on that more uh, and then you can pass it. But we can still find that uh, sometime you can see from the votes uh, those delegates that are actually against the bill. Uh, in nineteen eighty seven, only two thirds of the NPC members support the fee watch that. One third abstain. So if well the same case if you refer to the Chinese leadership, you have to pass, you have to vote for the Chinese president, the Chinese premier, and for Li Pang, okay, uh, the American former Chinese premier, he got very little vote. I mean, still 1,900 something, but still you have 200 extinct. But 200 extinct, it means it's a protest vote already. So I would say this is a proper step, but somehow it reflects some sort of you know discontent from the members, okay, whether. Um, that canon is, you know, uh, good or is supported by others or if he or she is well, okay. Uh, but anyway, basically they would pass everything you submit to the National People's Congress. Um, and the last one, of course, this is about the Military Affairs Commission, okay. So I guess I can skip this, okay, because we spend a lot of time on that one, okay. So um, I, I guess maybe the problem is that, you know, uh, whether we will have the civilian people to control the military. It's not a party member. I mean, if you still have the party member to control the military, it's never civilian government. So this is the point uh, for you to consider. This is the key, I mean, problem here. Um, and this is the reform here for the military uh, sections here. Uh, I just put it here because, you know, this is something new and latest. It seems that Xi Jinping will try to cut the size of the army and then you have the, you know, uh, enhancement uh, of a space force. The space force actually, this is the second artillery forces, uh, what they call here, uh, sorry, a second, this one. Originally it's the second artillery corps here. Uh, they manage missiles, defense and uh, ICBM, nuclear weapons here, but now it seems that they want to expand that unit by cutting the size of the army. And then you can expect that you know, it's going to be, you know, perhaps a response to the Indian missile, you know, development. Because I know that the Indian missile of them, the AG-5 model actually covers most of the territory in China. So you can imagine that you have the response from China naturally because, you know, they want to also emphasize on the missile defense. Uh, not only the US, you know, Japan, but also, you know, perhaps India, but, you know, uh, let's see what happens. Uh, basically, they want to have professionalism. Lesser soldiers, uh, more sophisticated weapons, and that's the case. So, uh, I'll apologize, as mentioned, I will try to go over this very briefly because of the time and the constraints here. So, for marginal thought, okay, um, I would say marginal is quite careful, uh, to be fair. If you still remember in the previous lecture, we talked about the divisions of the Communist Party uh, in the late 1920s, whether we should stay in the city or whether, whether we should you know, go to the world area. And Marjadon would choose to go to the world areas because he found that the Western experience is not going to be you know, something applicable to the case of China. So um, for that concept, Marjadon later on study you know, further. And then he find that you know, for, for China, we are not going to target the industries we're not going to target the factories, we're going to target the peoples, and then is the force. That's why you have NAM reform that we have come across, right? So that's why I would say, you know, uh, the major differences for Marxist force is that, you know, they still agree with the ideas of, you know, Marxism, uh, Leninism, uh, but he would say we should put these two theories into the context of China, incorporating this with the Chinese culture and the Chinese situations. Uh, apart from that, um, the key is presence, right? Um, but he also create a lot of those, uh, what we call uh, practical uh, ideologies. For example, the Mars 9. You come, to, you come from the Mars. I mean the leaders, they come from the Mars. You come from the Mars, then you must go back to the Mars. 
you try to consult the ideas, you try to make sure that the points you, you have implemented is correctly you know, done uh, within the mast. So this is the mast map. And the second um, concept of the mast map is that if you have some distance with the people in the mast, then in the long run, you will lose your support. So this is not something, I mean, similar or directly similar to democracy, but I would say uh, somehow is uh, quite relevant to the ideas that we have to consider people's wishes. So it's not entirely for the but of course it turns out to be uh, the outcome, but I mean, the master is something good, originally. For two reasons here, much of the argument is that, you know, uh, every people used to have the self-consciousness, the same with the with what Karl Marx argued. But he would expect the trans people to do more so that you can try to help to build a society. So th this is something normative. I'm not going to comment too much on that. But for contradiction, is here two things. Long antagonistic contradiction. It means that you know you have a group of people that are heading for the same direction, let's say collectivization reform. But you have conflict, you have disagreements over the means and instruments. So a lot of them would say this is not a big I mean, issue because you still have the same goal. But the major problem is about the antagonistic contradiction. It means that you know they have different aims. One advocate communism, the other would suggest that we go back to capitalism, and then this is the problem. So all the time when you have to, let's say the 1957 anti-Wittis campaign, this is anti-antagonistic. You wipe up those people who support capitalism and bourgeoisism, okay? So this is what about contradictions here. Caste struggle, the same, uh, with permanent revolution. Marginal believe that you know if you want to move the society forward or improve it, the best means is to keep on, I mean, uh, criticize the other classes. Keep on, you know, uh, I mean, um, <coughs> criticize things, you know, uh, I mean, the whole process of the revolutions. When you have the struggle, when you have the competitions, and then you will move the society forward. So that's why we have a lot of those political campaigns in China, from anti whitist campaign movement to the cultural revolution. So that's why some scholars will say that Marginal really believe that we should have this kind of campaigns to drive China success in the coming future. Um, the last one is seek truth from facts. Uh, it means that you know Marginal he focused a lot about empirical evidence. When you implement the land reform, when you implement the cooperatives, he always asks those countries to go down into the village. Uh, to observe by yourself, and then you, you try to you know uh, study the cases whether this is the this is the fact, and then we can learn from the fact, and then whether we should continue to reform. But as I mentioned, most of them will not go to every village, right? And you have to be out on the cartridges. The cartridges actually they they didn't share the same view with most of them because they want to be provoked. Remember the the, the chart. If you want to be a man in the Politburo, then you will have to report some fake data, a good statistics for maybe production gain, and, or even nowadays, uh, the GDP growth in the cities. You, you will have to report a very good statistics to them. So that's why, you know, um, in the past, originally this is something good, but it never implements very properly because of that kind of system. Um, so, um, Basically, you know, uh, if you refer to those ideas here, I guess that, you know, uh, marginal is more a kind of mixture of, you know, pragmaticism and also, you know, some sorts of idealism here. But if you refer to Deng Xiaoping, then he is absolutely pragmatic. And honestly, uh, Deng Xiaoping, because he comes from Sichuan province, so someone would say he's not really educated, even though he received education from France, uh, but anyway, uh, regarding Deng Xiaoping here, this is the quotation from Deng Xiaoping. So what is socialism and what is Marxism here, we were not quite clear about this in the past. Marxism attached utmost importance to developing the productive forces. One of the shortcomings after the finding of the People's Republic was that we didn't pay enough attention to developing the productive forces. So it means that you know, uh, you can reject capitalism, uh, you can reject, you know, uh, what we call market economy, but for Deng Xiaoping, he would say if you do not have the basic foundation, or if you do not have the necessity 
how can you talk about sharing the stuff with others? Right? So that's why he's a pragmatist. He wants to develop trans economy before we can move forward. And this is why we would say this is socialism in Chinese characteristics. The procedure is that you, you postpone the transformations to a later stage. You develop the trans economy um, to a satisfactory level first. And then once you think uh, it's not appropriate, and then you will move forward for communism. So this is how good Deng Xiaoping justified the Chinese economic reform. How could China adopt market economy? So this is the justification here. But to me, the problem is that you know um, when will be the appropriate time. If you are co if, if you try to study the theory here according to Deng Xiaoping, then we should finally adopt communism. But no one ever tells you know when will be the best time here. Um, but basically, Deng Xiaoping would say that you know uh, it will come sooner or later. So no matter what, well, we get into means that no matter this is about white cat or sorry white mouse or you know back mouse. Okay, sorry, sorry, yes, cat. So yes. Nowadays, mice is cat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's it, it happens always, right? The mice can catch the cat, right? Yeah, nowadays, it's like. like <laughs> Sorry, okay, it's about the white cat and black cat, you know, whether they can, you know, catch the mice, okay, a mouse, okay, then um, we're not going to doubt whether you know, this is about, what well, this is whether this is about capitalism or this is about socialism, no matter what, if we can achieve the uh, ends, then it's going to be the case, we can support this. And then you have the four kind of principles. Um, Donald Trump would say that, well, we should uphold socialist world. But think about this, upholding a socialist world, this is to, I mean, uh, make sure that, or to make assurance to those people who are not quite familiar or who are not quite supportive to market economy or capitalism. So this is an assurance. Um, the dictators of the proletariat, it means that we still stay in the part, in the mass line of the majority of people in China, okay. Uh, leadership of the Communist Party this is, you know, in the state spread, right? Because, you know, everyone knows that we keep security here. And upholding Marxism, Indianism, and marginal reforms. Um, so, uh, you can you can find that, you know, when you compare with marginal reforms, Dama Xiaoping worked within the context of, you know, Marxism, Leninism, and marginal reforms, but he would refer to a more pragmatic approach, a more instrumental, you know, approach to make China to have some sort of progress and development. Um, regarding Jiang Zemin, the three representative theory, or the three represents, uh, the first one, uh, the CCP represents the developmental needs of China's advanced production capacity, the progressive direction of China's advanced culture, and the fundamental interests of the board of majority here. Uh, but if you ask me, I would say, What's that mean for the developmental needs of trans advanced population capacity? It means that you have the new emerging social class and they're the rich people because of the reform. Some people they're getting richer and richer, and some of them actually are the entrepreneurs or the you know CEOs or you know some sorts of companies or corporations here. But the problem is that they have never been represented in a party. If you think about the case of the dispute between UK and the US, I mean um, the U.S. was the colony of the U.K., but they doubt whether we should live within the U.K. because the people on the eastern coast of the United States, they have no representative in the U.K. parliament. So that's why they speak. Chiang it seems that, you know, uh, he has already foreseen this kind of problem, so that's why he tried to include the newly emerging class in the society. Uh, but again, we have a problem here. Should the Communist Party accommodate the business person's interest or the corporate's interest, right? Whether this is something against the Communist Party, you know, uh, ideas. Uh, I would put something at the back here. Whether this is for new social class, party image, or something else. Something else, I mean, the personal uh, glory of Zhang uh, Because you can leave the name in the Chinese constitution. This is your theory. The same case for Hu Jintao. 
harmonious society, uh, scientific development outlook, this is not something really ide ideological. <laughs> Everyone can say that I'm working for a harmonious society, I'm working for a, a better scientific policy here. So if you ask me, I would say this is the privilege. This is this is the you know something that as a Chinese leader you can put on the constitution. No matter what you way you done something, then you can put your name in the constitution. And then next time, the leaders, I mean the, the newcomers, they will say we have to follow you know Marxism, Leninism, marginal thought, uh, and then uh, uh, Deng Xiaoping theory, and then uh, the field representative theory, and then a scientific development and how much society. <laughs> you add it up. So the Congress time will be much longer, just like Xi Jinping, he talks over three hours because you have to repeat all the views. Mm -hmm. um, the last one, uh, this is really the last one, okay. Um, for Xi Jinping, I, I just want to ask you, what's the theory? Because Xi Jinping just proposed the theory and it was already written down in the constitutions in November, October uh, last year. Any the idea? <coughs> Very good. Socialism in China's characteristics, but the key word is in new era. He put this into the constitutions. This is a new theory. But how could he differentiate with the previous Deng Xiaoping's theory? He would say, we have something new. We have already achieved the economic development. In the coming 30 or 40 years, we are going to have a fundamental change. And that change is going to move China to be part of the developed country. And the second thing is that you know, um, China will be a great power again. We will begin to grow. We will pay differential in in terms of things. No matter what, this is the theory that he proclaimed. It's now time to move on. We have to drop the no profile policy in the past, both domestically and also internationally. Uh, some questions uh, for all of us to think about. What's the role of the ideology of Chinese politics? If you ask me, I guess marginal is important, Deng Xiaoping is important, because this is about whether you should develop further economically or whether you should do something else. But less about the case of Jiang Zemin and Hu Jintao. This is not something very important. Uh, even for Xi Jinping, I have doubts on that. This is not really about ideology. Um, another, you know, issue is that you know uh, some scholars will put nationalism as an ideology, which I heavily include in this, you know, talk. But we can discuss, we can think about whether nationalism would be also a kind of ideology. Um, and the last one is that you know this is dangerous. If you propose too much ideologies, apart from the long meeting time, what happens if you couldn't deliver uh, what you have promised to the people? Remember, we don't have the election here. And if you couldn't deliver, uh, what would happen? We have no idea. Maybe perhaps a protest. Maybe perhaps you know you have a general kind of the polarity of the you know particular leader in the party. But what would happen, right? So this is something that they have to blame, uh, and this is the game. Uh, but I have one more minute, okay, for the game here. Uh, this is the elite already game in you know China from 1921 to 1998, okay. But you can of course try to update the game here. So let's say. You join the CCP in you know 1921, okay? So you have different layers here. You, you, you can move up earlier than the other people, right? For example, if you uh, join the Jing Feng program, is that you know you try to um, uh, join the campaign to modify some you know odd behaviors or bourgeois behavior, and then um, if you join that campaign, actually you can promote to a senior position. So then if you join the collateralization, so then you can move up. But if you uh, if you, let's say, reach here, and then some years later, you, you can fall in June 4th. If you stand on the side of the economic liberalization, and then you can, you, you, you can fail, right? And then you can drop here, right? Uh, the same case that, you know, if you uh, join the party later, but then you were one of the, the, the generals, or you, you make a huge military achievement in the civil war, then you can be promoted, and then you have different leaders to get, you know, up and up. Uh, this is about the support of world reform here, and this is, you know, how could you get to the final stage here. But all the time is that, you know, uh, I put something like death here. What happens if you die, you know, in, in the middle of half here, right? If you die, then sorry. So let's say, um, you can die where? You can die in the Cultural Revolution. So Deng Xiaoping, 
he's a tough guy. A strong determination, he's not going to, I mean, step down, right? So you survive, then you can be promoted. Uh, what happens if you die in the good environment, right? Or you can also die in the Tiananmen Rose and, you know, uh, whatever, right? Um, so if you add up more later, I would put SARS in 2003. Because SARS actually also, you know, uh, it's a political crisis in the party and then some characters they fall. If you think about the case of uh, Bossy Lai, you can fall when you organize a group date with spell group D8, right? Uh, if you organize the Olympic Games, then you can be promoted, perhaps, right? You can add up all those events here, but remember, what we are talking about, there's no clear regulation for promotion. Different from the Western countries, there's no key regulations. So what you have to do is to refer to the personal network. Where do you come from? Your background. What have you done? And whether you make your bid correctly. And this is about Chinese party and ideologies.